I've said it before and I'll say it again, making movies is hard. You want them to be exciting without being cheesy, explosive but deep, fun but meaningful. In short, it's difficult, and no matter how good you are, big movie moments that are supposed to prop up an entire picture sometimes simply don't work out. Here we're focusing on the damp squib, the firework movie moments that's introduced with explosive fanfare only to fizzle out when the main movie narrative proceeds to ignore it completely. With that in mind, I'm Will for What Culture, and here are 10 huge movie moments that didn't matter at all. 10. Chewbacca's Apparent Death Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker There's a lot in The Rise of Skywalker that doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Chewbacca's death, however, is a different kind of nonsense. It was Rey's error that killed her friend, her giving in to her darker emotions that fueled the Force Lightning that destroyed the ship he was on. Sidekicks and partners are tools of the narrative trade. Being sacrificed for plot points is kind of what they're for. Everything was set up for Chewie's death to mean something, to be a turning point for Rey's development only for it to be walked back literally three minutes later, when Chewie was revealed to be alive and still a prisoner. But that's okay, Rey didn't know. This is still a developmental moment for her. Except Rey finds out that he's alive ten minutes after that, resulting in the whole thing kind of feeling like a waste of time. 9. Christopher's Story – Silent Hill Silent Hill sees a desperate mother Rose take her adopted daughter Sharon to the mysterious town of Silent Hill to investigate the kids' nightmares about the place. Rose and Sharon disappear into the sideways hell dimension that the town fell into two years ago, leaving her husband and Sharon's father Christopher back in the real world, baffled and searching for answers. Christopher's search leads him to a 30-year-old photo of his 9-year-old daughter, and visiting the orphanage she came from, it seems as though he's about to get the answers he's after, whereupon he's arrested by the cop, who was supposedly helping him earlier, who menacingly tells him to go home. You'd think that this moment of revelation and confrontation sets up Christopher to elude the cops, find his answers, and help save his wife and kids, but sadly not. We next see our supposed hero nearly half an hour later, being escorted out of town, and then he just goes home, like a good boy. It kind of all came to nothing, really. 8. Everything involving the Duke of Wesselton, Frozen As everyone who's seen Disney's monster hit about the power of sisterly love knows, Frozen's big Disney villain is Prince Hans of the Summer Isles, a massive a-hole who betrays Disney Princess Anna despite swearing his undying love to her by way of a goddamn Disney duet. Yet Hans is only unmasked in the final act. The first act sets up an entirely different villain. You'd be forgiven for having completely forgotten about him, because the film does, but the scheming Duke of Wesselton introduces himself by literally speaking aloud his plan to exploit the newly opened kingdom and strip his neighbouring trading partner of all its resources. Sadly, however, aside from shouting a little bit and those awesome moves at Elsa's coronation ball, the Duke of Wesselton does precisely nothing throughout the entire movie. Despite this, he is escorted from the kingdom at the end in disgrace, because in the last five minutes, Frozen remembers that he's one of the bad guys. 7. Riggs's fake death means nothing, lethal weapon Investigating retired General McAllister and his shadow company, LAP detectives Martin Riggs and Roger Murtaugh are targeted by McAllister's men. McAllister needs to know what Murtar knows, and kidnaps his daughter to force his cooperation. Riggs, however, is surplus to requirements. McAllister orders him killed, not realising that Riggs is wearing a Kevlar vest and has survived the assassination. This is considered to be a good thing, as the lethal weapon of the title cheerfully tells his partner that they have the upper hand. McAllister thinks he's dead. As we turn the corner into Act 3 and the dramatic confrontation in the desert, this is our hook, the compelling twist in the narrative that we're eager to see play out. Our two mismatched hero cops will use Riggs's supposed death to their advantage to take down the villain. And then, less than ten minutes later, Riggs is easily located by the bad guys, and both men are captured and tortured by the mercenaries. So much for the upper hand. 6. Kirk is forgiven and promoted to captain in record time, Star Trek Into Darkness Following his compound fracturing of the Starfleet's prime directive in the first ten minutes of the movie, Jim Kirk falsifies his reports to hide his actions, but is dobbed in by Spock's inability to tell a lie. Found guilty by a closed tribunal of several orders of gross misconduct, he's stripped of his rank and his ship, and barely escapes being booted back to the Academy. 
It's a big gut punch that the movie then entirely takes back literally 15 minutes later when Admiral Marcus reinstates Kirk, a man who never graduated Starfleet Academy, to the captain's chair of the Enterprise. The reason being that Marcus is going to use Kirk as a patsy to start a war with the Klingons, but that barely matters. Once again, Kirk has suffered no consequences for his actions and achieves no character growth as a result. 5. They had the spell all along, bed knobs and broomsticks. In this beloved Disney family fantasy musical set during World War II, trainee witch Miss Eglantine Price is searching for a spell that can help the British war effort. Aided by three orphan evacuee children in her care, Miss Price heads to find Professor Brown, who doesn't have the spell. In trying to find it, the five of them travel the length of London doing song and dance numbers, are captured by a British light entertainment legend, and finally travel to the otherworldly island of Nabumbu to find the Star of Astaroth, a medallion which has the magic words inscribed upon it. They find it, but the medallion then disappears as it can't exist in the modern world. All of their efforts seem to have been in vain. It's then they discover, however, that the whole last hour of the film was a wild goose chase, as the picture book one of the kids stole from Professor Brown's house way back in the first act has a picture of the Star of Astaroth in it that shows the magic words. It all just feels a bit contrived, even for a film from the 70s. 4. Kenneth Doesn't Turn Dawn of the Dead 2004 Having established that the Dawn of the Dead zombie apocalypse, like most others, is spread through contaminated wounds, director Zack Snyder makes a big point of an early scene, where our protagonist Anna is seen washing infected blood from her hands in the mall's water feature. You even get a shot from underwater showing the blood spreading. Minutes later, the calm is shattered as more of the undead attack and gruff cop Kenneth is tackled into the same water feature. In the process, there's a very clear shot of Kenneth's arm being cut open as he falls into the water. This is Dramatic Irony 101. Snyder draws a big circle around both scenes with a fluorescent marker just to make sure we don't miss them. The meaning is clear. Kenneth is not bitten and will think he's in the clear, but we know differently. At some point, he's going to turn. And then he doesn't, because the movie forgets all about this grim little bit of foreshadowing. Not only does Kenneth not turn, but he survives for the remainder of the film. 3. Ant-Man and the Wasp kills its own ending in the post credits scene Ant-Man was released following Avengers Infinity War, which had climaxed with the bleakest cliffhanger imaginable. However, since it was set before the events of that film, initially Ant-Man and the Wasp cheerfully ignored it. That is, until Thanos finally caught up to the narrative, the godlike snap of his fingers wiping out Hank Pym, Janet Van Dyne, and Hope Van Dyne in one fell swoop, stranding Ant-Man in the quantum realm. The thing is, this took place in the post credits sequence. The actual ending to the film had seen former antagonist Ghost promised a cure for her terminally phased condition, using energies mined from the quantum realm, where Janet had been marooned for the last two decades. That's what Scott Lang was doing when the snap caught up with the others. Ant-Man and the Wasp didn't just have a killer ending, it killed its own ending. Without access to Pym's technology or the quantum realm's energies, that promise of a cure for Ghost was immediately invalidated. Sadly, if she survived the snap, she'd be left to die in the meantime in unimaginable pain. 2. The whole X-Men movie franchise There's a lot of bad things about X-Men The Last Stand. Let's just save time and agree that it's a bad movie. In fact, it was so bad that the end of the next movie in that present day timeline presents us with Charles Xavier back in his old body again with no explanation aside from a throwaway line about having gifts just to inelegantly stumble over the fact that the franchise killed him off in Last Stand. Wolverine is flabbergasted to see him, so clearly the movie isn't walking back Xavier's death. It just decided not to explain how he came back to life. Of course, the franchise then massively course corrects in the following film, which sees the events of X-Men The Last Stand completely wiped from continuity, walking back on Xavier's death after all. 1. Silver's convoluted plan makes no sense. Skyfall. The 23rd James Bond movie became the biggest movie of the franchise. It even won awards, so it's odd that so few people have noticed that the plot is kind of very sloppy. The villainous Raoul Silver has his men steal a hard drive containing the names of British undercover agents, hacks MI6's server, and blows up the headquarters of British intelligence. 007 heads to China to track the hard drive down, captures Silver, and brings him back to MI6's new underground HQ for interrogation. But this was all part of the plan. Silver has a vendetta against M. He escapes, foiling his pursuers with an elaborate prison break scenario planned years in advance that includes explosive charges to bring down the roof on the London Underground. 
For a start, this is leaving an awful lot to chance, as Bond could have just killed him, he does have a license for that, but whatever, it's a film, you know, you suspend your disbelief. The real issue with the plotting is that after all that setup, all Silver actually does is show up at M's parliamentary hearing disguised as a policeman and shoot the place up. He and his men could have waltzed into the country under fake passports and done exactly the same thing without any of that previous nonsense, and they would have never even known he was coming, either. So there you have it folks, 10 huge movie moments that ended up not really mattering at all. Feel free to drop this video a like if you enjoyed it, and drop me a follow on Twitter at YouSlideDogU. I'm Will for What Culture, thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you next time.